we're going to go ahead and get started. So last time we introduced Faraday's law. which showed us that we could create a voltage by having a changing magnetic flux and then this negative sign out in front is so important that it gets its own law called Lenz's law and we'll talk about the implications of Lenz's law today. The, so this change in magnetic flux, we can achieve three different ways. So remember that magnetic flux is defined as B dot product with A which we can simplify as the magnitude of B times the magnitude of A times the cosine of the angle between those two vectors. And so now changing the magnetic flux, we now have three variables that we can change in our equation. We can change the magnetic field, we can change the area or we can change the angle theta. So if we change the magnetic field, we would get this equation. If we change the area, you would get this equation. And then if we change the angle, you get this equation. And so there's a lot of extra terms in the the last equation because of calculus. So you don't need to know why. So this is changing angle. And so the application that we saw for this uh, was that this is how an electric generator works. For example, you have in a hydroelectric power plant, you have the water coming from the top of the dam and falling to the bottom of the dam that rotates your turbines. And so that rotation is the delta theta, uh, or wait, I have too many terms down here. Uh, so this, This omega is the delta theta over delta t. Uh, and then the second one, we're changing the area that the magnetic field is uh, exposed to. And this is called motional EMF. And if we have time today, we'll, I'll show you an example of that. And then the first one is changing magnetic field. And that's what we're gonna talk about first. This is voltage, magnetic flux. 
this. Ah. So what we'll talk about now is how the Faraday's law where we're changing the magnetic field, uh, how we apply that principle to circuits. And so the way that we do that is with a device called an inductor. So the variable for inductor is capital L and the unit for induction or for an, an the inductance of something is capital H, which is uh, Henry, named after the person that did a lot of work with inductors. So the type of inductor that we'll work with in this class is just a solenoid. So we've talked about a solenoid before, and a solenoid is basically just a so imagine you take one loop of wire and then you stack it one on top of the other until you have a bunch of loops of wire. So it would look something like this. So another way you could think about it is if you took a cylinder and you just kept wrapping your wire around the cylinder, you would make a solenoid. And so the, the symbol that I'll use for a solenoid in a, a circuit will look like this. So this is the symbol for a solenoid for an inductor. In a circuit. And so with a solenoid, we, if we put a current through the solenoid, uh, so we remember from our right-hand rule, if we have a current flowing through a loop of wire, we would put our fingers in the direction of the current and our thumb would point in the direction of the magnetic field. So if you put a bunch of loops of wire right next to each other, then all of those magnetic fields will add up and they'll all point in the same direction. So for this solenoid here, we have a magnetic field that points in this direction. And an important conceptual note is that the magnetic field inside of a solenoid is constant, or not, maybe not constant, is uniform. So what that means is it doesn't matter where you are in the solenoid, the magnetic field will be the same. So whether you're close to the top of the loop or the bottom of the loop or the right-hand side or the left-hand side, as long as you're inside the solenoid, the magnetic field will be the same value. The equation for the magnetic field of the solenoid is this. All right, this is the magnetic field. This is the permeability. of free space or how easy it is for a magnetic to magnetic field to exist. N is the turn density of the solenoid or in other words, little n equals capital N divided by L where big N is the number of turns and little l is the length of the solenoid. 
And then I is the current flowing through the solenoid. So we're gonna take this equation for the solenoid and we're gonna plug that into our Faraday's law equation and see what we get. So we have this for our magnetic field and the Voltage is change in flux over change in time. And so we're going to take the first example where we change the magnetic field. And I'm going to get rid of the, or I'll write it down, and then we'll just say that the angle is zero degrees. So you get cosine of zero equals one. So the cosine term will just go away. Okay. So if we replace or we substitute this definition for B into the equation, we'll get negative mu naught n i over delta t. So this is uh, kind of a calculus thing, but uh, we can reason our way through it. Mu naught is a constant, so you can't change mu naught. And lowercase n is just the number of turns per length of the solenoid. So as long as the solenoid doesn't change, then little n can't change. So the only thing that can change in this equation is the current. So if we pictured this kind of device in a circuit, so we're going to put a battery and hook it up to an inductor. I'm going to put a switch here. So we'll say at time equals zero, the switch is open. Or I guess I'll just call this initial. And then I close the switch and current starts to flow. So when the so when the switch is open, 
there's no f current flowing through the circuit. When I close the switch, now the current will start to flow this direction. And as the current gets to the solenoid, now the solenoid is experiencing a change in the current flowing through it with respect to time. So here your current is zero and therefore also your change in current is zero. But here your current is increasing And so delta I over delta T is positive. It's some number greater than zero. So because the solenoid is experiencing a change in current over change in time, it's going to induce a voltage that's in the opposite direction that the voltage from the battery is in. So there's gonna be some, I'll call it, maybe I'll do it in a different color. I induced, that's now in the opposite direction to the current that first started flowing into the inductor. So let me know if you guys are following that logic. Yeah, so when I have the switch open, there's no current flowing through the circuit. When I close the switch, the current now starts flowing, I guess it'll be clockwise, the way I have drawn it, the black current. When the current reaches the inductor, now the inductor went from having zero current flowing through it to having, let's say one amp of current flowing through it. So now you have a change in current over change in time, right? We went from zero current to one amp of current. So the current is changing. Because the current is changing, we have to apply this Faraday's law that we just derived, where a change in current will induce a voltage. Now, the direction of that induced voltage slash current is going to be the opposite direction, and that's because of the negative sign out in front. So this is why Lenz's law is so important and why it has its own, like why a negative sign in an equation has its own law, and that's because the direction of the induced current is gonna be in the opposite direction as the current that first started this whole process. So I'll talk more about what this means in the circuit, but there's, uh, Something else that we need to look at. So we're gonna take this equation. And now the So the, if we look back at our magnetic field equation,
now we have a, and I guess I'll draw this picture again. Voltage inductance. This is the direction of the current from the battery. And this is the direction of the induced current. So initially, the black current would make a magnetic field in the solenoid, but then this induced current that points the opposite way would make a magnetic field in the opposite direction. So this process that I've just been describing is called self-inductance. And so there was only one solenoid involved in this picture. And so it was responsible for inducing this current in itself. So that's where the name self-inductance comes from. We define the self-inductance of a solenoid like this. Where this L is the self-inductance. Mu naught is the permeability of free space. L is the length of the solenoid. A is the cross-sectional area. And N is still the number of loops. And it'll turn out when you do some math that the voltage that you uh, induce in this process is going to be equal to negative delta I over delta T times L. And so you might be asked to calculate the inductance, but usually you'll just be given the value of L uh, in the problem. And then you can use the change in current over change in time to figure out the direction of the induced voltage and therefore the induced uh, current. So now conceptually, what does this mean for your circuit? Uh, so we'll talk about RL circuits. Uh, so R is for resistor, L is for inductor. So this is just a circuit that has a resistor, which is the pointy squiggle, and then the inductor, which is the curly squiggle. I guess we need a switch. 
also So when we close the switch, the inductor opposes the change in current through the circuit. And then after a while, the current in the circuit is no longer changing. And so therefore there's no induced current. And so what that means in practical purposes is initially when you turn, when you close the switch, the inductor acts as a break in the circuit. And after a while, after the switch has been closed, the inductor acts as a wire. So maybe I'll draw We draw this. So at time equals zero, this picture will basically look like this, where there's just a break in your circuit and your circuit's not gonna work the way that you think it will basically. But then after a while, as, so you can think of that as time goes to infinity, The inductor stops influencing your circuit and it just becomes a straight wire. So this is the break in your circuit. And then over here is the, it's just acting like a wire. So if you wanna draw some parallels with capacitors, this is kind of the opposite of how capacitors work. Uh, so when you had a capacitor and a resistor, so an RC circuit, uh, when you first close the switch, the capacitor just acts like a wire and lets current flow through your circuit. But then after a long time, once your capacitor is fully charged, then it stops all of the current flowing through your circuit. So inductors and capacitors are kind of the 
the way that I think about them is they're kind of the opposite of each other when you put them in a circuit. So what we just talked about was self-inductance. So an inductor causing itself to have an EMF or a voltage in the opposite direction of the one that was supplied to it. There's also mutual inductance. And so that's when one inductor will induce a current in a different inductor. So this has a different symbol, M, capital M. but it still has the same unit of Henry's. And so the picture for this, if you imagine a, so let's say this is your solenoid, and we'll call it L1. And there's a current flowing like this. And we'll say that it makes a magnetic field pointing this way. If we, and then we build another solenoid over here and we hook it up to say a voltmeter or an ammeter. L2, so if we change the current flowing through L1, so current flowing through L1, L1. so delta I over delta T, I guess I'll call it I1, Through Faraday's law, we saw that that's going to make a changing, or just from this equation for the magnetic field of a solenoid, we see that changing the current is going to change the magnetic field. But now inductor two is in the presence of a changing magnetic field. So according to Faraday's law, that means that we'll get a an induced voltage in inductor two, because this is delta B over delta T times A. And the changing magnetic field is due to the current changing in inductor one. So you would get a, an equation that looks something like this. So if I take an inductor and I so I take two inductors, I have one that has a current flowing through it and another one that is just sitting there not connected to a power supply. If I change the magnetic field in one of them, I can induce a current and therefore a magnetic field in the opposite or in the, the one that's not hooked up to a voltage.
And because of Lenz's law, that current is going to be in the opposite direction. And depending on the geometry and the orientation of your different inductors, you could calculate the mutual inductance M, uh, but you'll probably just be given the value of M to plug into uh, this equation. So uh, just like for self-inductance, you had the this kind of equation, you'll you'll have a similar one for mutual inductance. Where if you take M, which is the value of the mutual inductance, multiply it by delta I over delta T, then you'll get the voltage that you induce. And so now we're gonna see a, a practical application of this mutual inductance. And this is gonna kind of tie up a loose end that we had from earlier in the semester. So we're gonna talk about transformers and not the giant robots, but uh, the thing that lets you transmit high voltage electricity over power lines and then convert it into a much lower voltage for you to use in your household appliances. And so a device that looks something like this is capable of doing that. So this is an iron piece of metal. And we're going to wrap an inductor around it. And so the current coming into here is from a high voltage call this inductor one. And then over here, we have inductor two. And so what we have to remember is that when we talked about transporting power, so how to transport electricity efficiently, Uh, we said we needed two things. We needed high voltage. And that's because the higher voltage you use, uh, the wires in your circuit or your, your transmission lines are going to have some resistance. And so the higher voltage that you put across that resistor, the less power is going to be consumed by that resistor as a fraction of the total uh, power that's put across it. And then the second thing that we needed was an alternating current. And so this 
situation is why we need an alternating current. So we can, if we're, we have a high voltage and there's a current that's coming into this inductor, if it's an alternating current, then that necessarily means that we have a change in current over change in time. If we have a change in current over time, we know that we can induce a magnetic field through the solenoid. And now because this is an iron piece of metal, iron is very good at orienting its internal magnetic field. And so this magnetic field will come around here and now we have a so we have a change in current we also have a changing magnetic field A changing magnetic field will induce a current through this secondary inductor. And depending on the configuration of these two inductors, like the number of turns per unit length, we can step down the voltage so we can take the high voltage that comes into inductor one and then change it into a lower voltage coming as a result of inductor two. So inductor two is going to supply a lower voltage, say for example, to your house. And that's much safer for people to be around and all of your appliances and stuff are built around using this lower voltage. So we, this kind of closes the loop on what we talked about earlier when we were transporting electricity. We need high voltages and then having an alternating current will allow us to get a changing magnetic field through inductor one for free, basically. And then that changing magnetic field will induce a current in inductor two due to Faraday's law. And so for, with this kind of a system, we basically get for free the ability to go from a very high voltage to a very low voltage. And that's why we want to use an alternating current source.